Uh, and this meeting is being recorded. Okay, noted. Um, <clears throat> perfect. So uh, again, great to meet all of you. I will uh, highlight a little bit about my background, of course, and why it's relevant for today. Um, also highlight a little bit about XFund, um, how we invest, where we invest, um, and then it's kind of, you know, tricks of the trade um, from the entrepreneurship side, um, especially during a pandemic, which is, I mean, honestly, is just completely uprooted a lot of different things. Um, certainly the future of work um, and in some respects, how we're approaching investing. Um, great. So background, I am born and raised out here on the West Coast, actually born at Stanford Hospital um, and basically grew up right in Silicon Valley, um, did undergrad at Stanford in class of 2008, which seems like eons ago at this point. I had my 10 year reunion a few years ago and I felt just so old, um, but here we are. And uh, did um, I, about four and a half years um, at a venture firm um, starting in 2010 called DFJ, uh, Draper Fisher Jurvetson, now called Threshold Ventures, where I got to work on a lot of our investments in um, companies like Tesla, now public, um, SpaceX, uh, Twilio, also now public, um, which recently bought Segment. I'm sure you guys saw that this week, big news. Um, Yammer, which was acquired by Microsoft um, about three, four years ago for 1.2 billion. Um, Box, which is an enterprise software company, also now public. Um, so I've focused a lot of my time on infrastructure and application software, um, B2B, um, and then some consumer companies as well. Uh, and then I am a Harvard grad, so I got my MBA class of 2014. Um, <clears throat> and uh, after that, it's helped build a portfolio at a small fund called Rothenberg Ventures, where it was for about two and a half years, where we were early investors and a handful of our friends and colleagues um, from undergrad and business school starting great companies. Um, uh, and that's anywhere from Gusto uh, on, on, the, on the cloud payroll side um, to uh and Della also in, in, in New York, uh, recruiting software uh, solution, helping um, to plug talent into companies in the US, uh, helping train engineers actually in, in, um, in Africa, super cool company. Um, and um, on the consumer side, we're investors in Chubbies and Robinhood early on, which has been an incredible, incredible journey to be a part of. Um, and then now partner at XFund. So early stage invest, investment funds, uh, predominantly seed investing with this very targeted focus on university founders. Um, so folks like yourselves coming out of undergrad, grad school programs, PhD programs, et cetera, um, starting companies, um, as opposed to perhaps taking a more default career path, um, like joining the investment bank or consulting or Google or what have you, which are phenomenal, great career paths. I don't mean to belittle them in any way, um, but for those folks who are a little bit di wired differently, who want to be creative and working on a company that they just have to pursue full time, um, that's that's our business. Um, and we were founded by the new engineering school at Harvard, which of course, as many of you know, have its um, its new campus finally, um, <clears throat> right across the river, um, right by the iLab in the business school. Of course, couldn't have thought about worse timing. It was <laughs> set to open uh, this year. Thank you, COVID. Um, so now everything's remote, unfortunately, um, but we're the for-profit venture capital fund on the campus at Harvard um, that work very closely with MIT just down the road um, and out west, Berkeley, um, Stanford, and um, also, I guess, also out east of Wharton and Penn, um, but open to everybody regardless of university affiliation. We've just built some substantial um, institutional networks and, and um, relationships with these core universities, either student groups or professors to identify and support great founders. We're fortunate to be early investors in a company called Kensho out of, out of Harvard MIT, which got sold to S&P Global a few years ago. Um, and actually it was the largest AI exit in history, um, financial services um, AI business, um, started by a gentleman named Daniel Nadler, who was actually a funny story. He was a PhD student in economics at Harvard um, and he was at the, he was actually not even thinking about taking his, his product and his business as a for-profit commercial entity at the onset. In fact, he was working as a career academic economist with the Fed in Boston and had built this really interesting financial analytics package. And, and we met him and said, Daniel, if you want to build this into a business full time, um, as opposed to taking a more academic um, career path, we'll back you. 
Um, and we ended up doing so and helping him, you know, build the, the squad around him and ultimately raised a big Series A, a giant Series B from Goldman Sachs and sold the company less than three years later. And a phenomenal outcome. Um, so we're very comfortable meeting and investing in founders that are very early in their journey um, and may not even entirely be sure if it's the journey that they want to take full time quite yet. And we'll meet them at that juncture and help them um, and put them perhaps to the extent they, of course, want to take it full time. And it's 100 percent their choice um, towards a journey where we can help them, of course, raise money. Um, meet co-founders, um, helping with their go-to-market strategy, uh, meeting kind of initial pilot customers as well. Um, that's really where we shine. Um, my ex fund colleague is a gentleman named Patrick Chung, who spent about 10 years at NEA um, before X fund and uh, uh, was the first investor in um, Plaid, which got sold to Visa um, segment, which we just talked about, just sold to uh, Twilio. Um, 23andMe as well, where, where he's currently on the board, um, and he heads the direct -to consumer. Used to head the direct -to consumer practice at NEA before spitting out X Fund from NEA um, roughly 2012. So it's the two of us. Uh, we also have Jaden on our team, who's um, currently uh, helps to run Harvard Student Agencies. She's a senior at the college um, as well. She's great. Um, so that that's a little bit about me, the fund, what we do. We write check sizes, but roughly 500,000 to 2 million. Um, usually first institutional money and love meeting founders very, again, very early on, helping them think through the bit, the, the pitch, the business, um, enterprise and consumer focus. We do some health IT investing as well. Um, and uh, for the purposes of today, I think, you know, I think the most productive use of the time could be predominantly Q&A. Um, I mean, I can talk about what we've seen be really successful in our portfolio uh, with respect to kind of overall fundraising and pitching and, um, you know, what's really worked now in this, in, in the age of the pandemic, um, <clears throat> you know, certain companies have just had incredible tailwinds um, it, it, because of just generally remote work, uh, distance learning, um, you know, over the top streaming entertainment technologies. We were the first investor in a company called Philo, um, P-H-I-L-O, which right, came right off the Harvard campus and they're the skinniest, it's basically a skinny bundle of content for the a really cheap subscription. I think it's less than $10 um, for access to all content ex except for sports, basically. Um, and they've just been growing like a like madman out of the gates. Um, I think it's one of the fastest OTT over the top streaming um, uh, companies right now in the market. So we've seen this really interesting kind of divide in our portfolio that some have really benefited from um, the effects of COVID. Um, and then others perhaps exposed to the travel or hospitality industries, for example, that have just gotten absolutely crushed. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, sometimes it's better to be in, you know, lucky than good and be in the right industries that have suffered or, or not. Um, one other particular example is um, we are investors in a company called Kia, K-E-A, and a company out of, out of, out of Penn, and they've built a, a particular um, technique of artificial intelligence is, is called um, NLP, natural language processing, which is basically voice transcription. Um, and we're always looking for uh, unique applications of AI that are highly commercializable, not necessarily the actual tech, the actual um, infrastructure algorithms themselves. Um, and in particular, this one example of NLP um, applied is in the context of quick serve restaurants. Um, they're helping, helping multinational chains such as Domino's or Five Guys or, or, or Papa Murphy's or Papa John's to, um, as opposed to employing people to take phone call orders or call centers, they employ um, an NLP bot, basically software, um, to help fully um, take in that phone call order. And as opposed to, of course, utilizing people to actually process that order, they use software. And ultimately that order gets pushed into the point of sale system and then sent out to the, of course, the respective delivery company, um, which is appropriate given where the customer is, to have that full soup to nuts order to delivery be all done via software, um, as opposed to involving anybody, um, any, any human. Um, so it, again, a brilliant application, in our opinion, of NLP. And in the, wage, in the age of COVID, when we invested about a year and a half ago, so way before the pandemic, we're doing you know, pilot revenue, spinning this up to see how just, you know, the how they can increase basket size per order because you can be upsells, uh, upsell potentially if you want to cope with that, that kind of thing. Um, and then being able to decrease costs with respect to having to employ people. 
Um, and they've now scaled basically from zero all the way to almost 4 million a month um, during this time of COVID and expanding inside Domino's and Papa John's and other large chains uh, in part very well, much so catalyzed by pandemic. Um, so we're always thinking about what companies of course can leverage a growth curve like that given totally new and new restrictions. Um, and so uh, another prime example is a um, company called CureBase in our, in our portfolio, um, Harvard College grad named Tom Lemberg, who's building a distributed digital clinical trials management solution so to help um, folks participate in clinical trials at home in a, in a, in a, in a distance manner as, as opposed to in person across hospitals and clinics. Um, and then the management workflow behind that um, all through CureBase. And so they've seen, of course, in the wake of COVID, an incredible spike in, in their engagement and uh, growth in their customer pipeline. So again, sometimes there are industries that are super favored from this and um, others that, of course, that may suffer. Um, <clears throat> so of course, as you're thinking about what you're doing next, always being able to have a good answer as to why now, what specific um, unfair advantage or that you have or macro trend that you're writing and why this particular 2020 timeframe is, is appropriate for the solution that you're, that you're actually building. So um, the whole why now slide of the pitch is I think important, um, is generally emphasized, but I can't, I don't think it can't be emphasized enough. Um, so anyway, I can, I can continue to blabber on, but I definitely want to make sure I take some questions. I think people do, do, do have them. So, so Brandon, uh, you're, you've clearly done um, super well for yourself. Uh, but I will kind of start this off by, by calling you out real quick. Um, I, I reached please out do. to you. Sorry? I said, please do. I love being called yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. So I, I reached out to you um, on LinkedIn. Uh, actually, like, so January 31st. And uh, I basically, like, what's up? I said, I've been caught. Uh-oh. Yeah. Okay. So, so you actually did. You did get back to me. Uh, oh, I did. You, you told me to, to email you but then you didn't get back to the email. So that was kind of the issue there. Um, now, obviously you're super busy. You get asked for money all the time. Um, and I know there's no exact like formula to this, but for, for you specifically, what would you say is the most effective way to sort of get your attention on a pure cold um, outreach? Um, and if you have any like general strategies, that would be very helpful as well. Actually. I'm going to shoot you my number. Uh, that way I can make sure to use this opportunity to make sure I get your attention. Here it is. I just pulled it up and I did respond for the record. <laughs> but yeah, I actually do see it here. Um, sure. Just for, if also for the purposes of the, of the, of, of the whole group. Um, uh, I, you know, and I kind of talked with this at, at an event I did earlier this week because it, it is um, uh, important that, and it's even more acute now in the pandemic, just given how much we're investing at the earlier stages when it's people, people predicated and how they come in and how you initially meet them, what process that comes in is super, super important. Um, uh, because now so much of our investing is on Zoom versus being able to meet you in person. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, LinkedIn is an amazing tool. Uh, it's also free for the most part. Um, and, uh, I think a lot of VCs manage it well, uh, or at least um, try to. I, I can put myself in the try to column. Um, and I, if you can, you know, I think the best way, as opposed to a cold outreach email, um, which I would love people to, to respond to all of them, obviously you have to prioritize your time, um, is the best way is to go warmly through an existing founder that we've backed that you may know, or we work with tons of student groups on campus. We work with Harvard Computer Society. We work with Harvard Student Agencies. Um, we work with this organization's HUCP. So like, there's a way in, right? Like, and through, through a trusted referral network, which I would take nine out of 10 times versus a random email to me, um, which sometimes make it lost in the fold. And not because I purposely want to lose you in the fold, but it's just because it, I, just, I just can't respond to everything. Um, so it's just, that's, that's I think the best way in. And, you know, some of you, I think, can take advantage, especially of that, if you have the .edu email address. I mean, I never, when I was in college, quite understood the value of that. I think nine out of 10 of folks will respond to a student um, 
asking for help or needing something, especially if it's their alma mater or an institution that, that they care about. Um, because they can think back to the time when they were in your shoes and they knew nothing and they wanted help and they were just kind of looking for advice and guidance on something. Um, and, and I think you're in the catbird seat as a student to be able to, to, to leverage that, especially when you have the alumni database of an institution like any of the schools I'm sure that all of you come from um, that would I'm sure be more than happy to help you. So I wouldn't underestimate that. <clears throat> I, I, I will say, your question, so, Marla, so I'm not but... only calling you out, um, ever since we connected on LinkedIn, a massive like floodgate of second degree connections opened up. And so that was very helpful. Yeah. And look, it's not because it's like, you know, try to, you know, try to come at me in some way. Right. I don't mean it like that. What I mean is, is um, it's, it, it's a, just a better trusted referral network of stuff when it comes in from people that I know and trust and respect um, that gets just put to the top of the funnel versus, some random outreach, either LinkedIn or randomly at Brandon at xfund.com, um, which, which very well I could respond to as well, right? I mean, it's not like it's, it gets a no, it's just higher likelihood. Yeah. Um, and I, if you can find a company that allows me to have not 12 hours in the day to work, but like 120, I'll invest in that. Cool, I'll send you a deck. <laughs> yeah, please do. Awesome. <clears throat> hey, um, for the sake of organization, if Anyone has a question, maybe you can raise your hand um, and then we can go through the participants like list. Um, but yes, please keep thinking of questions and um, okay, great. Michael, if you wanna unmute. Uh, yeah, Brandon. So um, I had a, a question surrounding the, um, uh, the interest for like early stage investors uh, in companies that may be like it's better off operating with very small it's amounts of investment and may actually never be sold or go public mm -hmm. uh like how does is how would like an early uh, seed or, or pre-seed investor kind of uh, uh filter through those companies to understand kind of like oh hey yeah they, they may need the first 500k to get off the ground mm -hmm. but once they're off the ground it's like additional investment doesn't serve a lot of purpose it, it doesn't really accelerate growth because the product itself has such a like um high uh, uh ltv to coca like its ratio that you can basically sustain you know like like a large amount of growth on no additional investment um, so if, if I understand the, the, the question correctly is, um, does it, does it make sense to pursue funding? Even if you did raise 500 K, do you want to raise future funding on top of that? When you think you have a very positive year economic story, should you well, not raise investment follow on to that and just let the company continue to grow? Well, yeah, that's part of it, but, but it's more of the question is pre like it's seed investment or pre seed investment. If you understand like your product and the unit economics enough to know that like your, your like it's your LTV is it the coca ratio could be 25 30 x instead of like two or three x of a of a normal SaaS company that you don't need large amounts of additional it, it, it's capital inflow once the like engine has been kickstarted. Yeah, it, 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 because for like a seed investor, from what I understand, is it's a lot of them don't hang around until like IPO exit. They uh, are cashed out maybe in like the A or a Series A or Series B round. It's just because uh, their money and value add focus is no longer mm. it, it, it necessarily in line with where the company is going, and they've already kind of made their return. Yeah. Um, I, I actually disagree um, that seed investors, at least institutional seed investors, will want to cash out or a pre-seed. Honestly, we kind of lump them together, even though it's pre-series A is kind of a bit been bifurcated now into pre-seed and seed. Um, we kind of just say first institutional money in seed round. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we definitely would never sell in a series A or very, 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 we never have very rarely sell in a series B context of a company, especially if they're growing 
and attracting capital to warrant Series B investment, why would we sell our stake when a Series B investor would only invest if and only if they believe the valuation of the company at that Series B mark is baseline. Still rising. Yeah. And there's substantial 10X plus, probably more, 20X plus value on top. Why would we sell? To be able to take cash off the table and distribute to our LPs at a very early on time frame in our fund life? Maybe, I can think of that as a, as a, as a reason. But why do that when you can leave all the chips on the table and have that entire stake eventually be worth more. Um, we definitely are aligned on making first institutional checks, 500K to 2 million predominantly, we can flex up or down. And more often than not, if the company goes from a seed all the way through a series D or E, um, we're reinvesting. Uh, we've done this four or five times. We're the, we're the first check in, in, um, in uh, Pick an example, Zumper. You guys know Zumper, apartment rental search company, like mm -hmm. one of the biggest platforms for, for, for that. Um, uh, HBS 2012 grad, Anthemos CEO, we were his first investor, reinvested in the Series A, the Series B, the Series C, and the Series D. So we, when those happen, we're protecting our ownership in the company and reinvesting and believing every time that we don't want to be diluted. We want to make sure that... Uh, and, and we probably will not reinvest in a series E or an F or, you know, depending upon if the IPO is, is ultimately going to be the right game there. I can't speak to that, but um, we will be, cut up, be cutting off around the series D timeframe. Um, but we generally reinvest if we believe there is substantial headroom uh, and valuation beyond that particular series. Uh, I'm not sure this is answering your question, but I, but I think the, the, the takeaway on that is it's important to, I think, ask your investor certainly seed if they're institutional, um, less so angel, what their general and conventional plan is in follow on rounds, if they participate or not. If they don't almost every time and it's a blanket no, then there's less signaling that when a series A does arise and that seed investor doesn't reinvest, it's a bad thing. Like we know more than you because a seed investor, then they're there from the start. We have the most information on the company. We don't reinvest, why? It's weird. Um, but unless it's you, you, you know, you have an overall uh, policy as a fund that you don't do that, and you kind of like don't signal that. We we're the opposite. We will reinvest every time um, if the, you attract follow-on financing from a great <clears throat> external party, and you have three criterion. You experience sustained radical revenue growth. We're still excited by the company's product and business roadmap. And the management team has been able to consistently hire and retain phenomenal talent. If those th kind of big three are met, we're reinvesting. We're not stopping. Um, that's a very important question to ask, again, an institutional fund, um, if you were to take their money at the seed. Does, does that help, Michael? I'm not sure if I answered your question, but is there anything of, related to that? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's, I guess my, it's original question was about how, how you analyze a potential companies that, where the, the end goal may not actually be to ever sell the company or IPO, but just- Oh, I see. No, so, um, cool. So I, I'm sorry, I mean to go on a tangent if that, if I wasn't answering your question. The, the um, uh, I'd say more often than not, our liquidity comes, comes from M&A. Um, Obviously, if we, you know, catch the next Twilio or Box that ends up going public, we won't, we won't be upset. <laughs> um, but I'd say, I don't know the exact numbers on it, but it's, you know, eight out of 10 or nine out of 10. I mean, most, the vast majority of outcomes are M&A um, or, or acquisitions into a, a sponsor, which is generally a large growth private equity fund that just buys out a vast majority of the company, over half usually. And we can get liquidity that way. Um, so we're, we're very, very comfortable. I mean, Kensho was bought by S and P global for nearly 700 million. Um, that was an incredible outcome when we invested at a $5 million valuation. So, um, uh, yeah, more often than not look, liquidity comes from M and A versus an IPO. Um, yeah, it's good. Uh, thanks. Of course. If there's something else, just email me. Yeah. I want to make sure I, I answer it. I, yeah, yeah, that's fine. 
it's I'll email you after because it's uh, I don't want to take up too much time here. So yeah, because it, it may be nuanced to your situation. So yeah. <clears throat> Hey, um, Adam. Hey, thanks a lot for your uh, time, Brandon. Really appreciate yeah, it. Of course. Uh, yeah, so I, I think it's it's kind of interesting. Like you invert, you invest early stage. You know, specific IT obviously is is one of those uh, industries, and you're looking at like novel approaches or applications of AI. Yeah. So, like, stage novel approach or novel application of AI like what are those like what are those uh, like traction points that you're really looking at because that to me means that they really haven't um, applied those algorithms yet or maybe it's just that their testing phase or maybe they do have some user traction I'm just curious like what what that looks like for you and what's most important to see for an early stage company utilizing AI but mostly focused on like the unique approach got it great 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 question um, so uh, I'll, I'll answer that by first level setting on the techniques themselves that I specifically like to look at. And, and by the way, I'm not a deep technologist, meaning I'm not spinning up data science algorithms on Sundays and you know, predicting you know, who's gonna win the Niners or the Rams, that kind of thing. Um, I wish I could, but that's not me. Um, <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> uh, computer vision, um, NLP, uh, again, voice transcription, and then of course, um, applications of ML predictably or pr predictably uh, more often than not from a, from a prediction lens. Um, and uh, I'll answer the question by giving an example. Um, we invested in this team at a Stanford called Sorota Medical, um, which is uh, basically using computer vision and actually techniques of deep learning to assist radiologists uh, with the process of doing diagnostics on radiology imagery. Um, that's part of what they do. They're also reinventing a lot of the workflow and the PAC system um, to help radiologists with um, better diagnostics, um, being able to uh, throughput as well as so being able to see more patients, having you know the machine quote unquote supplement their work. And I think a big aspect of and part of the thesis as to why we invested is the management team had proprietary, unique access to data at the onset by partnering with a handful of the largest radiology clinics in the United States, which no one else has. That is, that is a proprietary unique advantage on data with respect to training a system that will be the most accurate. Um, so I think the kind of prop data set argument is reigns very, very um, highly for me. Um, so that's one, if, if you, you know, companies that go out there and say, yeah, we're scraping the web and, you know, spinning up a model based off, you know, grabbing a bunch of open stuff on the web about, you know, contacts from people or whatever, it's like, what's unique about that? Um, <laughs> why can't any other company be able to just, you know, build a scraper that's equally good as yours, right? So, um, or a massive data set that's equally good as yours. Um, so the big one to me is kind of data set uniqueness and, and, um, and, and origin. And then um, how often that's being replenished is another question. Um, and then um, I think that also dovetails into uh, engagement in the product. Um, because higher engagement generally leads to higher data exhaust, which generally yields um, higher accuracy. Um, so depending upon the application, I'm always looking to see how, um, how engaged the end pilot customer or a customer base is with the solution to ensure that in the future, from a reinforcement learning perspective, the algorithm gets refined to be better and better and better. Kia is a prime example. They started in pizza with one or two locations in Domino's, and then they expanded the menu um, capabilities, and they can now do not just pizza, but also burgers and sandwiches and a whole bunch of you know, different free products. Um, because of higher engagement initially within pizza, they could refine the algorithm to get super accurate, and then they spun up uh, a, a new data set around sandwich ordering, I think, excuse me, burger ordering, and all the different nuances associated with that. Um, <clears throat> and then they were able to get more and more data. And then since people are ordering on a daily basis, more often than not, one loves burgers, uh, you're getting more and more data and the data is refreshed. So I'd say product engagement is another big one to it. Then I think in Moneyplace, it helps to create a moat for you. Um, so I, I would sum it by saying prop data um, and um, kind of engagement metrics within the product and solution, again, to help create that moat. Um, and then I think the third is now we're seeing more and more revenue being generated from applied AI companies. That was probably less the case, you know, seven, 10 years ago. Um, 
and now people are, you know, with, with the, you know, efficiency and, and um, capabilities of um, computer vision now, um, and even NLP to a certain extent, we're, we're actually seeing substantial revenue being, being created from these companies and Kia is no exception. Um, so I will judge you by revenue. If you are in market launched, you know, should be generating after X many months or quarters speaking with customers. I, of course, am going to look at, you know, cohort retention. I'm going to look at churn. I'm going to look at, you know, your conventional, if it's a SaaS business, for example, uh, the kind of KPIs that, in my opinion, would, would dictate value. Awesome. Yeah. Crush that it. help? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Is, yeah. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Cool. Let's, okay. let's, uh, uh, yeah. I'd love to see what you're, I mean, if you're working on something cool in that world, for sure, let me know. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Every one of those bullets, I'd love to like elaborate on, but um, yeah, I'll give okay. somebody a moment. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry if I'm losing my voice. It's been a long week. <laughs> hey, Ida. Hi, Brandon. Thank you very much for this interesting conversation. Um, I have a question about your minimum market size that you consider and also looking at X Fund's website, it seems like you don't really invest in hardware, healthcare devices, I guess medical devices are outside of your interest. Could you comment on that, please? Sure, Thank you. of course. Yeah, of course. Um, so we, uh, a part of our origin story is we were, um, in addition to Harvard, we work and that were co-founded um, by two other venture firms and those are NEA and Excel. Um, and NEA has a very much so thriving medical device practice. They're you know, one of the best in the business. Um, at X Fund, and NEA, by the way, has a massive multi billion dollar fund. Um, we are not. We are 75 fund two, 120 fund three. So we are um, a rounding error in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the grand scheme uh, from a competitive perspective. But what isn't a fit for us generally goes into the loving arms of NEA or any other large fund that has a focus on specifically med device and, and, and that, that is not us. We, we have done some companies that of course will require FDA. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the 23andMe FDA, um, uh, what's the right word, journey. <laughs> um, and uh, that, that, that of course had to happen and they navigated it extremely well and are doing very well as a company. Um, but med device specifically, uh, we we do not do in part because we don't have interest. We don't have interest. We don't have you know substantial expertise there. Um, but I'm more than happy to send stuff, whatever you're working on, to NEA or any other fund where I know they do have a specific focus there. We uh, on your hardware question, we do invest in, in um, specific hardware solutions. In fact, our most recent investment, um, unannounced, um, but I'll announce it, is. Um, uh, a, a couple of um, folks out of, out of, out of um, Harvard College that are um, uh, building a fully autonomous level four, um, <clears throat> really a, a, a tug, a, a cart um, that helps move um, cargo and um, really luggage from point to point inside airport um, context. So bring in your luggage, bring in cargo, um, usually from of course gate to baggage claim would be an example. Um, all that is done today pretty much by people uh, driving um, and hiring and retaining labor for that has been extremely difficult. Um, and when you think about um, autonomy investing, in, in, in my opinion, certainly level four and level five, which is basically like certainly level five is, you know, non um, labor uh, in, in, uh, involved is looking at rules of engagement and playing in very sandbox controlled environments. And that is precisely what an airport offers. Um, because you do have those roads, you have exactly where, where carts are supposed to be driven. And so you can build a computer vision, you can build a rule of engagement and, and for, that, for that particular autonomy um, uh, uh, sensor suite, whether it's computer vision or LIDAR, for that to be successful. Um, so it is 100% a software company that also, of course, part of their solution is definitely hardware. Um, I would say their IP and focus is definitely on the autonomy side. Um, but we generally shy towards software first. Um, but what hardware these days also isn't soft, isn't, you know, software first to begin with. There's like a, you know, mobile app attached to it or, or what have you. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Thanks. And could you comment on the market sizes when you were- oh, sorry, yeah, the market size. Um, you know, I, I think, I mean, everyone's gonna say billions, right? To quote Trump. Um, <laughs> But um, you know, I I 
obviously look at that. Um, but what, what really matters to me is if a founder has thought through the bottoms up P times Q analysis of literally the price you believe you're going to be able to sell your product for times the quantity of end um, of customers within your TAM, your total addressable market, and do a back of the envelope rough calculation of, of what that looks like. And I think some, you know, it, it has to be obviously in the billions of overall enterprise value of dollars flowing from one institution to another, specifically in that segment where you're building. It's <clears throat> a lot of folks kind of paint this giant picture of we're operating in the giant HR cloud SaaS world, of which is like, I don't know the number, but 50 billion is making this up. But really you're not, you're operating inside like these smaller, perhaps concentric circles of this particular TAM that you're going after, which also may be a subset of that 50, it may be seven or three, but it may be big enough to build an initial wedge, an initial focus, an initial products um, that you can start with and then upsell as you unlock net new features and bells and whistles inside the product to upsell the contract value um, and increase your overall um, ASP, average selling price inside that customer as you build more products that are complementary and ancillary to your, to your initial wedge. Um, so yeah, kind of a, you know, back of the envelope P times Q, here's what we're starting with. That mark is this big overall in years three to five, it's gonna look like this because we're gonna expand into these, pro into these different products and here's our roadmap to get there. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Of course. Okay, I think Roger is next. Also, Brandon, I want, to, I want you to keep the eye on the time. Um, eye on the time. We have like about 17 minutes left, just for your information, and a few questions to go. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, I don't lose my voice in that time. But yeah, okay. I'll try to to move super quick. But um, I'm curious, as a as a fund that focuses on early stage companies as well as universities. Um, I'd imagine that your, your assessment process is a little different from a generic typical VC. Could you maybe uh, walk us through that process and sort of break down the components that you're looking for in a, a given venture? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, uh, the company itself, like what are the ingredients that I'm looking at and assessing or the pitch itself? Or, or is this more like a pitch question, how to kind of nail that? Or like what, I guess they're kind of related, but, but what individual ingredients do I look at as I'm assessing a company? Right. That the team, market, communication ability, et cetera. Got it. Sure. Um, honestly, like when I go through a pitch deck, the three big, I mean, it may be 12 slides, maybe 25 slides, anything more than that's probably not going to take, it's probably too long. Um, but the, uh, I guess the first kind of three biggest slides I go on are obviously number one is the team, their backgrounds, where they come from, what's the founder journey, meaning what, was the initial kernel of the idea, what precipitated the initial start as to why they're doing this. People like anyone on this call have extremely high opportunity costs of their time. They could go do anything, to be honest. Um, Google, Goldman, whatever. Um, but they've elected to not do that and take a risk and be creative. And so what I always, the first question I ask, and this is of course hard to suss out in a deck, but. Um, why are you doing this? What what steered you onto this path? What was your background before or during school that, um, like I spoke to a freshman today at Harvard College who's building a, a, a solution for um, dementia patients because her parents have um, dementia, for, for, for example. Like, you know, what what has influenced you in your life um, that, have, oh, that can have like that play into the passion for why you're trying to change the status quo? That will take up some amount of time in our conversation um, because the worst thing you can do is say, you know, three buddies and I uh, came together and we're like, let's, we're going to start a company. And we thought of three different ideas. They all seem cool. Um, which of these three should I do? The answer is none. <laughs> um, that's not entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is identification of a problem that you've identified um, in your life and you are the perfect individual or team to go and solve it because you have a unique advantage in the market. Um, and so there's a lot of time spent on that. Um, obviously the market dynamics, who's currently playing in the market, um, what again, unique and fair advantage you have. I go back to the Serona um, <clears throat> medical example with the proprietary data set um, and partnership with some of the large clinics that no one else has. 
Um, I feel like very successful startups generally have a, an, an unfair advantage, um, even even more so at, at, at the onset, just given how competitive this world is. I don't want to assess out what that unfair advantage is for that company. If they don't have a very good answer to that, I'm probably out. Um, so sort of why now is another big one. We kind of talked about that early on is sort of what are the enabling technologies that are all coalescing today in 2020 or have been moving along at a snail pace, but have finally kind of hit some sort of semblance of escape velocity now as to why this could work now. Um, you know, everyone sort of said this could be the year of quantum 15 years later or 20, whatever it's been long time. Um, maybe, I don't know. I'd love to hear why. Um, and so kind of understanding what are the kind of enabling solutions or macro forces. Like I think a prime example, and this is kind of a trite one, but it's so true is like why Uber was successful in 2008, 9, 10 was, you know, obviously that time then was around kind of like, you know, social location and mobile, all of the, you know, the, the phone GPS accelerometer, um, you know, the advent of the Apple's app, the app store, kind of all of that together. Like if, if Uber started in, in 04, 05, like, you know, I, I don't even know if they could have, right? So like timing and infrastructure behind what you're doing to enable the success, I think is super important. So I'm always looking at that kind of, that, that kind of stuff. Um, and sure, you can send me a financial projection, <laughs> but like, who knows, right? And I think that the, 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 the thing around that is the, the fact that you've thought about it, you've put elbow grease into thinking, if we can hit X, Y, Z milestones in this time frame with this amount of capital raised, Here's what our revenue ramp looks like. Um, you may not hit it. In fact, the one thing we do know about it is that it's wrong, um, but that's fine. The fact that you've done it and you spent time thinking through it, I think is, 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 is what's important. Um, I think those are probably the biggest ones. Um, and because we're so early in our, in, in where we like to invest, we will do a lot of background reference Tracking and again, LinkedIn is a beautiful tool um, for that. And many folks you may offer as references and people we should talk to that can speak to you as a as an operator, as a as a as a student. You can talk to your professors. We can talk to your can talk to your roommates, whatever. But most of the time, some of that is just happening on you know behind the scenes sometimes too, just to make sure we we understand how motivated and, and how ambitious and, and how crazy passionate you are about what you're doing, um, because so much of it at this at this juncture is you, founding team, because you may not even see revenue for a year. Um, yeah, I think if I did boil it all down, those are probably the three or four of the biggest. <clears throat> awesome, thanks so much. You bet, Roger, no problem. <clears throat> London? Hi, I'm London Lomanstone. I'm a senior at the college. Thanks for your time. I yeah, was, of course. I'm working on a business that's doing consulting on go-to-market for deep tech that's selling to government. And this is like a super long, hard, difficult problem. And a lot of times I've heard VCs talk about wanting kind of like a hockey stick return on their investment. I'm curious as to what you think the best way to go around funding, even if it's not VC, how to get funding for something like that, where it's very deeply entrenched, takes a long time, but then you have a large, like solid market afterwards. Yeah. So London, I, I, I think if you're approaching the market from a consulting perspective, less so from an actual product, if I understand what you're doing, right. Meaning yes. very human intensive, um, hence, consulting versus actually building a scalable software solution for, per se, it's going to be difficult for a venture capital investor to get, to get their arms around that um, because we have to look for solutions that can, you know, scale super fast um, and reach a broader customer base. Um, and that also have very attractive unit economics behind them uh, with respect to like, annual contract values, high gross margins, you know, low churn, like all the things of why generally enterprise software and SaaS, if you look at the, the markets, the last six, eight months have just been just insane. I mean, I wish I put every nickel I have in like, you know, Splunk or whatever, like super, super impressive. And there's a reason for that, right? Um, you look at most of those, you know, net retention numbers, you look at, you know, 
obviously the gross margin figures and they're super attractive versus a consulting and consulting business, which by definition, it's very difficult to get leverage out of because it's predicated on people. <clears throat> and we only have so many times, so much time in the day and, and you know, so much time to work on a project, right? So yeah. I, I don't have a good answer to you on how you scale a consulting business like that. I, I know it's tough from a venture lens. You may be barking up the wrong tree if you try to go to venture firms. Okay. Um, but if there's some like productization you can build around that. Um, like for example, we invested in a company called Newton X, N-E-W-T-O-N-X, and they're completely reinventing the expert network concept. The expert okay. networks are, if you guys are familiar with like GLG or Alpha Insights, these like giant just databases of experts on the web. Great. So these guys are able to actually um, identify um, individuals across the web that are experts in particular fields and industries um, and then automatically be able to whenever anytime a customer which could be a consulting firm a bank a large corporation has wants to do diligence on something or wants to send a survey out a newton x will automatically um, using some interesting techniques of data science make that connection between that particular expert and company and they've got i mean they're multiple millions in revenue and working with a lot of the consulting firms and and and, and um and uh, you know, I think Facebook's a customer, Microsoft, 23andMe, et cetera. And they've kind of taken that consulting, you know, like people intensive industry of, you know, let's just add a white glove, like what white shoe service of making phone calls, connecting people and just allowed software to, to, to kind of um, disrupt um, there. And, you know, I think if Newton X came to us with a, you know, where, you know, the next kind of, you know, consulting type outfit, you know, people, people in project based, it would be a, a much, a much harder sell. That um, makes sense. Yeah. I wish I had a better answer, but it's just, you know, we, we just don't really do the consulting stuff. <clears throat> that was a great answer. Thank you. That's helpful. Cool. <clears throat> great. Lee. I wish I could, uh, you know, another one of my skills at some point would be lip reading, but I'm not there yet. Um, so I, I love, I, unfortunately, I think you're on mute. If you're using Bluetooth headphones, sometimes it does that. Yeah. No. The little triangle by your microphone oftentimes gives you options to select your microphone. You might be able to select just your computer for right now or something like that. How's this? There you go. Okay. Hey, all right, awesome. Thank you, um, thank you for the patience. And also thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's been great hearing from you. It's sure. funny you mentioned NLP though, because that's actually what my startup's doing. We're working on um, uh, transcription software in meeting settings for note taking. Mm -hmm. uh, However, that's actually not what my question's about. You mentioned something earlier about um, gaining initial customers and sort of um, how that can definitely be attractive towards investors. Um, mm -hmm. However, I was kind of curious as to what your strategy is generally in terms, or maybe advice you would give to someone in my position um, about how to kind of like uh, accrue even some initial customers. Yeah. Um, so I think you can't underestimate the importance of doing 50 to 100 initial customer interviews with a segment that you think your go-to-market will be in. And by segment, I mean looking at particular, you know, target customer base by size of employees, meaning how big they are. Are you going after enterprise? Are you going after, you know, 50, or excuse me, like 500 plus in employee size companies? Are you going after, you know, small SMBs that have, you know, less than 10 full-time employees? Um, you know, Gusto, for example, they were, they're doing, um, you know, cloud payroll for the SMB segment and the vast majority of their customers are small, medium sized businesses, with less than 10 employees. Um, so the fact that they were able to figure that out and isolate that particular segment and demographic of customer base at the onset and how to find them, what partnership channels, what way to go to find them um, has been super fruitful for them because where they live, where they breathe, find out and then go, go get them. So I think the initial customer breakdown and segmentation, I think is a good initial exercise. Figure out what that is. And you may, may take talking to a hundred different customers up and down the segment and realizing our problem is most acute with this segment. Cool, go there first. 
And then from that, once you identify that particular segment, um, then it's from there figuring out, you know, where they live and where they breathe. Um, are they, um, I'll use the, I'll use the gusto example with, with, with the SMBs. I mean, all, many of them were also, you know, uh, customers of Intuit, for example. Um, because they needed to use QuickBooks, very turnkey, you know, accounting software, which is mission critical to allowing those companies to be successful. So we should pursue a, you know, channel partnership agreement with a company like that to be able to, at scale, uh, get exposed to and be introduced to a lot of cus customers that are, um, you know, complementary to um, Intuit's customer base, for example. So it's about that segmentation and then figuring out ways to get to those particular customers sometimes through direct sales, or you're gonna to have to grow and manage a giant outbound sales team with account executives and SDRs and you know building a sales team, which is expensive, but can be highly lucrative if a majority of your revenue can come from enterprise grade or um, big enough contract values such that it can actually, the sales, the sales teams can kind of pay for themselves. And what I mean by that is, a sales rep, how long does it take for that individual to become productive? So you hire them, you train them, how many months down the line are they actually cash flow generating? Meaning how much new contracts are they selling? Essentially paying for themselves as a, as a salary. Um, and so that's one technique. We, we, we did that at Box. We built and managed a giant sales team and that was highly successful. Um, but we also had other channels of, of outbound. And one of them was exactly that, was, which is channel, which is partnerships with other companies where you can leverage their existing channel to sell your solution to their existing customers and perhaps vice versa. Um, yeah. That's kind of a channel sale um, plus the building and managing of a sales team approach too. And then there's courses of freemium where you go to the website and just get spun up that way, which sounds like is what you're, is, is what you're doing. Which yeah, is, well, that's sort of the, the route we're initially going towards, but um I think like talking to you, someone who, who is an investor, um, when we're really at these like quite nascent stages, is it, is it even relevant to you to hear that we have like 10 customers or do you need something more like in the thousands or something? Like that? Um, no. So again, um, I'm sure you're familiar. Our program gets better and better with the more people we have. We need, of course. We need data, you know, okay. and yeah. so it's the sort of getting over that hump where, like we're not really valuable until we have more people, but. Yeah, understood, yeah. Um, it's kind of like the overall kind of data flywheel, right? Um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I don't think there's a magic number where if you have 12 or you have 17, I'm interested. It doesn't really, to me, it, it, honestly, if you, have, if you have 10 and they're paying, then all of a sudden I'm sort of like thinking about, okay, like that's still kind of pre-revenue anyway, because the numbers are so small that it just, it's almost negligible. But what's, what's cool is I can actually talk to them. Mm -hmm. I can I, I can assess for myself um, how they found you, why they're using you, what they were using before they found you, and through you, how are they getting better business outcomes, which can be defined very, very many ways <laughs> um, on the cost side or on the revenue side. Um, so I think the benefit of having some X many customers is that from an investor hat perspective is that we can actually do some diligence with respect to understanding the value prop of your of your product. Um, you know, being pre, pre user or like, you know, pre data, pre, or sorry, you could say, yeah, yeah. Kind of pre data, pre, pre user traction or engagement. Um, but what you do have is a unique advantage through some other way, which may not be a data moat. Maybe it's something else that I don't know of yet about you or your, or your company. I'd love to hear it. Um, uh, but there's no magic number where all of a sudden you go from five to, you know, 17, all of a sudden I'm interested. It's, it's, it's about kind of what makes your, you know, transcription solution either better, faster, cheaper, or different from what's on the market. And I've seen a, a handful a, a, as of late um, in, in that world. And the biggest question in my mind has always been, how will a, how, how will a startup win that battle um, versus any of the other massive kind of enterprise productivity um, giants that have reams and reams of this, of this data um, and have the engineering prowess and the money to, to always be better, faster, cheaper, whether it's a Google or, 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 a, or a Microsoft or even a Slack. Um, I, I very well could be wrong, but that's, that's always going to be my question in that, in that space. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much.
Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Great. I'm so sorry, but we're going to have, Jordan, we won't be able to get to your question today. Um, but thank you so much, Brandon, for your time. Is there maybe like a way that they could reach out to you if they do have a question to follow up with this meeting? Um, maybe LinkedIn? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, look, like I, I, um, I appreciate everyone's time late on a Friday. Um, and I hope all this was directionally helpful. Um, I'm just Brandon at xfund.com and, uh, you know, um, Marwan, I promise I will respond. Um, <laughs> I love the call out. Um, but uh, yeah, if there's specific questions that I can be helpful with over email, even if the company is not a fit for us for whatever reason, maybe there's another investor we know that specifically has great expertise or focus in them, whatever you're building, like um, the, the gal earlier who asked about, you know, medical device stuff may not be for us, but there may be something perfectly for them that I can help with. So. Um, so yeah, that's uh, feel free to email me. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, Brandon, for sharing your expertise and your advice with us. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, my pleasure. And I hope to do it again. And hope it was helpful for all those involved. And again, feel free to reach out to me if you're working on something cool. I, I'd love to learn about it. Great. And thanks. huge thanks to Carissa and the HUCP teams. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you both. Have a good weekend, everyone.